this master lesson of the afternoon. I have the pleasure to introduce you David Aziza uh, that will speak to us about, that will make a lesson on data integration procedures for handling non-probability samples. If I can say some words, indeed I trust that uh, David can help us uh, uh, as a service statisticians about the frustration of not having the traditional lists anymore. And uh, indeed, this is uh, the problem of statisticians that uh, teach uh, courses of service sampling that are still based on the lists and, uh, uh, and uh, have to face uh, a relatively new problem. And uh, if I can speak about a small autobiographical experience. Uh, indeed, I uh, faced this problem because last year uh, I organized something about the topic of the knowledge as the uh, remedy to fake news with the students of the high schools that made a questionnaire in their school haphazardly. Moreover, uh, we trying to do something and we went with the experience of the students without saying how doing with no probabilistic samples, even at the Italian Festival of, of Statistics last week. But in the meanwhile, uh, I proposed the same topic to a student of the master program in statistics and so I told him, why don't you try to do something uh, about uh, uh, non-probabilistic samples? And this, he said, yes, yes, but he wanted to make a, a questionnaire to the WhatsApp group of the students of the course. And uh, at the beginning, he couldn't understand why I insisted on some way of treating the uh, non-probabilistic sample. And I told him, but listen, do you think that the people of the uh, WhatsApp group are equal to the group of the students that are enrolled in the program? Don't you think that the old, the un not popular, uh, <laughs> Uh, don't belong to the WhatsApp group. Oh, yes, madam, I didn't think about this. So, Professor Aziza, of course, you will speak about official statistics, but uh, there are also these small stories. Ah, of course, we'll come to the uh, audience that is not present in the room. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Daniela. Hello again, everyone. Uh, so it's an honor for me to, to give uh, this talk. So uh, today I will talk about a, a, a multiply robust uh, framework uh, for combining probability and non-probability uh, samples in surveys. And this is a the joint work with uh, Sisha Chen from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, so just a brief introduction. We all know that you know national statistical offices uh, have traditionally uh, collected data th through uh, probability sampling procedures, and uh, the main paradigm, the main approach to inference for many decades was the design-based design-based approach, where the properties of estimators were studied. Uh, with respect to the sampling design. So the inference was driven by the sampling design. But in recent years, uh, in national statistical offices at StatCan, but elsewhere, there has been a shift of paradigm. And uh, that can be explained by, by essentially three uh, factors. A dramatic decrease in response rate, increasing data collection cost, and also the fact that we have more and more data sources, but of non-probability uh, nature. So non-probability, non-probabilistic data sources. Uh, so for example, administrative files, opt-in panels, social medias, and satellite information. So the question is, how can we take advantage of these uh, uh, non-probability uh, data sources in our estimation procedures? Now we could say, well, why don't we use the non-probability data sources 
and, 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 and produce our estimate based just on the non-probability data sources is that they often uh, suffer from uh, selection biases. So they fail to represent the target population of interest. Um, so the question is how can we integrate data from non-probability samples and data from probability samples? And as you can see in recent years, Probably starting with Rivers 2007, uh, th there has been a lot of work, uh, there are a lot of reviews on, on, on the topic. And essentially, when we talk about combining uh, 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 data from probability and non-probability samples, we, we have three main uh, uh, procedures, or uh, we can classify the estimation procedures in three classes calibration weighting, statistical matching or mass imputation, and propensity score weighting of a non-probability sample. So the, the idea behind calibration, and I won't talk about this today, I'll focus on statistical matching uh, and propensity score weighting, but the idea behind calibration weighting is to calibrate a non-probability sample to estimated benchmark uh, that come from a probability survey. Uh, so this is a possibility, but again, I'm going to focus on the next two, which is uh, mass in, statistical matching or mass imputation and propensity score weighting. So uh, just a, a bit of notation. Um, we're considering a population, uh, which I'm going to call P, a finite population of size cap N. Y will be a survey variable, and Y I will be the uh, Y value attached to unit I. And the goal will be to estimate a finite population parameter, we'll call it theta zero, defined as the solution of the following uh, census estimating equation. So any parameter that can be uh, um, defined as a solution of this equation can be uh, incorporated in our framework. So I'll consider two special cases of this um, estimating equation. Uh, so if, if, we, if, if the, this u function here is simply yi minus theta and we solve for theta zero, we simply get the, the finite population mean. And if we uh, replace this u function by this uh, function here and we plug and we solve for theta zero, then we get the population uh, uh, percentile. So I'm just going to focus on mean and percentile, but any parameter that can be expressed as a solution of this equation can be um, brought into our, our framework. So what is the setup? I'm going, I'm going to assume I have two samples. I have a, a sample uh, SA of size NA, uh, which is selected using a probability sampling design, as usual, with first order inclusion probability pi i. So the pi i's are assumed to be known without errors as we have in classical probability sampling. Next, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that we have a known probability sample of size NB from the population. Typically, it doesn't have to be, but typically we expect that the size of the non probability sample to be much larger than the, the size of the probability sample. But typically that's what we have. So what is the data available to us? So for the non-probability sampling, the non-probability sample SB, we assume that we have Y, the variable of interest, and we have X, uh, a vector of predictors, a vector of size P, X1 to XP. And for the probability sample SA, we have X, but we don't observe Y. And the whole idea is not to observe Y because of costs. Um, and for SB, we have Y and X because it's cheap. So we, we have it, it's available. So th the question is, can we use it? So just a bit of notation that will be useful uh, later. I'm going to use the classical notation. I of I is just a sample selection indicator, which tells me if unit I is selected in the probability sample SA and zero otherwise. And similarly, we have a participation indicator, delta I, which is one if unit I belongs to the, pro the non-probability sample and zero otherwise. So we have these two uh, indicators. So if we summarize a bit what we have, we have here our probability sample, uh, and we have our variable Y, X1 to XP, and we have our indicator II. 
And so this, so here we have ii is equal one. So all of these are individuals selected in my probability sample, and they have an inclusion probability uh, pi one, pi two, to pi na. So the inverse, the, the design weights are the inverse of these inclusion probabilities. And I have the x for this uh, 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 for this sample, but I don't have, I don't have the y's. Now for the known probability sample, uh, now I have a delta indicator. So this part here are the people in my non probability that belong in the in, in the non probability source. The delta i is equal to one, and uh, for these people I have both y and x, but. For the, for the people who are here, the one did, who did not participate in my non-probability sample, I don't have Y and I don't have X. I have nothing for, the, for, 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 for the, these individuals. So this is the setup. So again, pi I is the probability that I is in SA, known for all I in P. Uh, in contrast, the, the probability of participation is unknown. So the, the probability that someone participates in, in, that I will find someone in my non-probability source, I don't control for this, so this is unknown to me. So this is the probability of delta i is equal to one, uh, conditional on x and y, and I'm going to make the assumption that after conditioning on x, uh, the delta i and the y are not correlated. So this is a more assumption. So, so this is what I, I was mentioning this morning, to be able to do some theory, uh, we, 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 we make the MAR assumption. So essentially what we're saying here is that the probability of participation is only a function of the X variables. And once I incorporate the X, I have everything I need. And this is what we are going to call the participation model. There is another uh, assumption, which is probably uh, most often violated in practice, is uh, I'm assuming this, uh, I'm making the, the positivity assumption. So I'm assuming here that the probability of participation is strictly greater than zero, and we know that this, in, 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 in practice, uh, uh, never holds. Now, dealing with, uh, 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 so if, if some units have a zero probability, it becomes like an undercoverage problem, and, and then it becomes much more difficult to, to solve. So there, there is a recent paper trying to, to, to um, overcome this positivity assumption, but it's based on some assumptions, right? and we need assumptions. So we have here a participation model for the probability of participation, and we also have an outcome regression model, and the, how, the outcome regression model describes the relationship between the y variable and the x variable, the vector of predictors. And so I have a, a general model. So here I'm going to consider uh, the family of, of semi-parametric uh, models. In other words, m is predetermined. Later, at the end, I'll, I'll talk about what happens if we don't want to specify M, so using a non-parametric or machine learning method. So I'll come back to this. But for now, we'll just assume that M is predetermined, so it could be linear on any uh, uh, semi-parametric model. And, and I don't need to make assumption about the distribution of the errors. I don't need to say that the errors are normally distributed. Um, are, are the procedures will work regardless of the distribution of the errors. So, uh, as I mentioned, we are going to talk about two things, statistical matching, or mass imputation, and propensity score weighting. So, in statistical matching, what is the idea? The idea is, if we, if we go back to this picture, the idea is that we are going to estimate the relationship between y and x based on the non-probability uh, sample. So, I have y and x here. I, miss, I can estimate the relationship, and then get some predicted value, and then impute the missing y values in the probability sample, and then compute the horvitz sampson type estimate estimator based on the design weight. Uh, so for example, uh, if, so I'll come back to this, but if we have a, reg a linear regression model, then that's, that's fairly easy to, to, to do. Uh, and so I'll come back to, to, to this in, in a few minutes. The problem is, we, when we, whenever we do mass imputation, we need to specify this outcome regression model. And if the first moment of the, the model is misspecified, then the resulting estimator will likely be biased. Okay. So this resulting estimator is vulnerable to misspecification of the first moment of this outcome regression model. Now, if we choose to do propensity score weighting, what is the, so here we need to specif specify a participation model. So the idea be behind propensity score 
uh, waiting is to say, okay, I'm going to take this unit that have participated and I'm going to assign them a weight to compensate for the people who did not participate. So I'm going to, and, and, and the way I'm going to assign the weight is by the inverse of the uh, uh, estimated participation probability. And again, this is this the resulting estimator uh, will be biased if the participation model is, is, is misspecified. So at the end of the day, when we look at the data integration uh, uh, setup, regardless of the approach, mass imputation or propensity score weighting, the validity of the point estimators relies on the validity of an assumed model. So point estimators are vulnerable to model misspecification. So the question is, how can we add some uh, um, uh, robustness to model misspecification? One way where we can achieve some robustness is through multiply robust estimation procedures. And as you will see, I will explain what is multiply robust imputation procedures, but, but the idea is, so it's an extension of, of, of doubly robust uh, estimation procedures. Um, except that we allow multiple models uh, for either the propensity score or the, or the Y model. So we have, so in, 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 in multiply robust, we have two classes of models. The first uh, class of model is a class of potential outcome regression model. So this is the model relating Y to the X variables. So I'm assuming here we have J models. So we, we have, let's say, five models. Now, the five models on the, y, on the Y variable may be based on different functionals. So the M function doesn't have to be the same. In other words, one, one model can be linear, another one could be something else. And also, even though I didn't put XJ, it, they could be based on different set of predictors. So we could have five different, totally different models. And we have a second class of, 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 of models, which is the class of participation models. So here I'm assuming that I have uh, K participation models. Again, the P function here ca can be uh, different and the X vector also could be very different. So at the end, I have J plus K models uh, in, in, in my framework. So how do we do this uh, multiply robust estimation? First, we need to estimate the parameters betas and then the parameters alphas from the model. So the, the betas are the, the, the regression coefficient in the Y model, Y is equal to MX beta. So this is easy, this is not difficult, because remember that if we go back to this, I have Y and X for the non-probability sample. So I can easily estimate the relationship between Y and X based on the non-probability sample. So I simply need to solve this estimating equation uh, we'll, we'll apply this to the linear model and what we'll get is the, the, the usual answer. But here the sum is over SB, the non-probability sample. So for example, if, if the GS model is a linear model, uh, linear regression model, so my beta hat coefficient is just simply the, 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 the um, uh, least square, esti ordinary least square estimator based on the unit in SB. In other words, I, I simply, uh, uh, um, estimated the relationship Y and X based on a linear model. And so for each of these uh, outcome regression models, so I have J models in, in my class, I'm going to obtain, a pred for each unit, I'm going to obtain a predicted value. So for unit I, I have J prediction of Y, let's say Y is income, okay? So I have J prediction of income, M1, M2, and MG, based on the beta hat one, beta hat two, beta hat j. So that's fairly uh, uh, straightforward. Now I want to estimate the alpha coming from the, 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 um, the um, these models, the participation models. This is more uh, uh, complicated. This is more challenging, but we have a solution thanks to the paper by Chen, uh, Li and Wu, okay? So what is the idea? And why is it an issue? Because if we go back to this picture, the problem here, I'm trying to estimate the model, the, the alpha parameter in the participation model. If we were in the non-response situation, unit non-response, typically 
we have the respondent with delta i is equal to one and the non-respondent with delta i is equal to zero. And we would have the x values for both the respondent and the non-respondent. And this is how we estimate the probability of response. But in this particular setup, I don't have the x for the people who did not participate. So I have an issue, okay? So this is why it's more challenging. But what we are going to do is, let's start by assuming that x is available for the people who did not participate. So let's assume that we have the x for these people first, and then, uh, so if we have the x for everybody, then we can solve for the alpha parameter in the participation model by solving this estimating equation. So for example, a special case could be the logistic function. Um, so I'm just using here PIK uh, uh, as, a, as a short uh, uh, notation for the, the, the probability uh, uh, PK of XI uh, and alpha K. So, so this, if we had all the X for all the population units, I could solve this equation, get the alpha. Now, um, I have the red part and the blue part. So I'm going to take the red part and the green part here, put it here. I'm going to take the blue part and the green part and put it here. So now we have two pieces. We have the first piece, which is the sum i in p over the population unit, but we have a delta i. And delta i is one if you're in the non-probability sample. In other words, delta i is one if you're here. Therefore, this sum is nothing else than the sum over SB, the unit in the non-probability sample. And for the units in the non-probability sample, I have the X values. So this is no issue anymore. No, no, I, I, can, I, can, I can deal with this because I have the X for the people that participated in, 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 in the, in, in the, in the, in the non-probability sample. Now, I'm, I, I have this part now. And this part is a population total uh, of this quantity. But this quantity depends on all the X for the whole population, and I don't have this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to replace the sum over P by the sum over the probability sample. And I'm going to use the design weight. So this is the horvitz sampson type estimator of the second part, right? And now I'm okay here because I have the X for the probability sample. So at the end of the day, I can solve this equation. So this is the nice idea in the Chen, Li, and Wu paper 2020. And once I, I can solve for the alpha, then what I have now for each unit in my sample, I, uh, I have a, um, an estimated participation probability. So I have K models, so for each unit I have K estimated participation probabilities. So what, if, if we summarize, what do we have? We fitted J outcome regression model. So for each unit, I'm going to stack all the prediction into a vector I'm going to call V1. So V1i contains all the information on unit i on the income, all the prediction coming from the J model. And I'm going to create an, another vector. I'm going to stack all the information coming from the K participation model. So we have P1, P2. So for each unit, I have these two vectors. Now the next step, I'm going to take each of the vector and I'm gonna compress each of the vector into a single score. So I'm going to take this vector and from this vector that contains the J uh, outcome regression model, I, I, my goal is to create one score that will summarize all the information that is contained in the J models. So one way to do that is to say, okay, I'm going to fit a linear regression model based on the unit, units in, in, in SB. So SB, if I come back here, SB, I have the Y and I, and I, and I have this prediction. So I have Y and the prediction. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to fit a linear model with Y as the dependent variable and this vector as the vector of explanatory variables. And then I'm, I can get a, a, a predicted value. So I'm gonna call this MI hat. So MI hat is the predicted value uh, obtained using this model. And, uh, and, and, and we, here we have the, the usual least square estimate where we see Y as the dependent variable, V1 as the independent, the vector of in, uh, predictors, and everything is based on SB. So we can view MI hat as a scalar summary of the information contained in, v, in V1. So now I'm, I'm back to a single score 
and it contains all, it's a summary of all the information contained in, in the J outcome regression model. And I want to do the same thing with V2, but we have an issue again with V2. Why? Because if I come back here, I don't have the X information here. So I don't have the, 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 the and because I don't have the X information here, I don't have these predicted values uh, for the non probability uh, for the people who did not participate. So again, what are we going to do? We're, go we, we're going to say, okay, let's assume um, that we have, so le sorry, let's, let's assume that V2 is available for all the population units, which is not the case, right? But suppose it is. I'm going to fit a model, linear model again, so a second linear model, with delta as the dependent variable and V2 as the vector of explanatory variable. And if I had V2 for all the population unit, this would be my predicted value to be, which I call PI tilde because I don't have V2 for all the population unit, but this is the, this would be the hypothetical uh, predicted value. And this uh, 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 tau tilde two is the least square if I could fit uh, 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 the, the model with delta as the dependent variable and V2 as the vector of explanatory at the population level. So this is what I would. And now I'm going to use the trick again. What is the trick? Is that this sum here contains a delta i. So this is a sum over SB of the V2. And I have, for the people in the non-probability sample, I have the V2 because I have the X, right? For this part here, this would require the X for all the population units, and I don't have. So what do I do? I use the probability sample. And so I'm going to use the Horvitz Thompson type estimator based on the probability sample. So this is where we integrate uh, probability and non-probability sample. And I'm going to use the design weight. And once I have this, and I have a compressed score, which I call PI hat, which is the predicted value uh, uh, for unit I. So if, if we summarize what we have done, we have J outcome regression model. We have K uh, uh, participation model. First estimate the beta and the alpha, which we've done. Then obtain two lists of predicted values, the M hats and the P hats. And then compress each, for each unit, we have a compressed score of these. I call MI hat, and I have a compressed scores of the P, which I call P hat. So this, those are two scores. So for each unit now, I have two scores, MI hat and PI hat. And now I'm ready to do estimation. So I can do propensity score estimation, I can do mass imputation, or I can do a combination of the two, which is an augmented estimator, okay, which, which I'll, I'll talk about. So this is where we're going. So what is the inverse probability weighting estimator? which I call T, uh, uh, IPW, theta hat IPW, is obtained by solving the sample estimating equation. So we, we, we take the sample estimate, so my goal is to take the people in the non-probability sample, and if I come, yeah, so the goal is to take these people who participated and inflate their weights. And I'm going to inflate their weights by the inverse of this uh, PI hat. And this PI hat here, is a, sum, a scalar summary of all the information contained in the uh, K participation model. So for example, if in the case of the population mean, the theta hat IPW will be simply the weighted average over the non-probability non sample, uh, uh, weighted by one over PI hat. So the Hayek type estimator, it's, it's like a propensity score estimator that we encounter in the non-response, in the unit non-response. And because PI hat is a summary of a, a, a scalar summary of all the information contained in the K participation model, we can show that uh, this estimator here or here is multiply robust in the sense that it remains consistent if one of the participation model is correctly specified. So if I postulate five models and, uh, and it, I just need one to be specified out of the five and this estimator will be consistent. So this is the propensity score. Now we can also do a, a mass imputation. So here I'm going to do fractionally mass imputed estimator, and I'm going to call it FME, FMI. Now, the, remember that the idea is to, I want to do mass imputation, so I want to impute all these values here, the, 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 based on the, the relationship we observed here. So um, if, I, 
if I had this expectation, which I don't, because I don't know the, the distribution of f, the, the, the distribution of f given uh, x, f of y given x is unknown. So, so I don't know this this distribution. But if I if I if I could have this expectation, this would be a consistent estimator because this is a horvitz sampson type, one over pi i over the the the, um, the probability sample of this expectation. So if I have this, this would be a consistent estimator. Of my uh, 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 my parameter. Now I don't have this expectation, so what I'm going to do? I'm going to replace this expectation by a, a, a weighted sum so, uh, uh, over SB. So I, I will come back in two seconds with with this. But at the end of the day, the idea. Let if we go back to the population mean. If I estimate the population mean, this will be my estimator mass imputed estimator. And what is this mass imputed estimator? Is a Hayek type estimator over the probability sample. And this piece here, this piece is the imputed value for, uh, uh, for the missing Y value. In other words, we impute each missing value here by a, uh, uh, using a fractional imputation. And then we take the horvitz thompson type estimator or the Hayek type estimator of these imputed values. So now the question is because at the end what we have here, if, if we come back here, we have a, 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 so each imputed value is a weighted sum of value because we do, we're doing a, a fractional imputation. So for each missing value, we impute several values and each is assigned a fractional weight Wij star. So how do we assign this weight? So if I come back, so this is uh, where we are. So I'm going to approximate this expectation by this weighted sum. And now we have to find uh, the, this fractional weight, Wij star, and Yi star j is the, imp the gth imputed value for the missing Yi, because for each missing Yi, I'm imputing several values. Uh, the sum of the weight is equal to one, this sum, the, the, this sum of the weights. And now the question is, how do we find these weights? So we're using uh, uh, empirical likelihood function. I want to maximize uh, so, uh, the, the, this uh, log likelihood over SB, subject to the constraint, uh, normalizing constraint, sum of WI is equal to one. And the fact that, uh, and also the, the constraint that the, the weighted sum of these error, these residuals, uh, uh, this weighted sum is equal to zero. And what are these residuals? These residuals is the residual is each yi, and, and I have this for SB, because in SB I have the y, and I also have the, the compressed score, the mi hat is the, the scalar that contains all the information that comes from the, all the outcome regression model. So this is my residual. And, uh, uh, and so once I, I, I uh, maximize this log likelihood, I find my, my weight, wi, and then this is what I'm going to put here. Uh, and then I'm going to solve this estimating equation. And the, the imputed value, the jth imputed value for unit i is the compressed score plus this residual e hat j, this residual that, so, so here we're taking into account all the information that comes from the, the j uh, outcome regression model. And so what we can show is that this estimator is multiply robust in the sense that it is consistent if one of the outcome regression model is correctly specified. Okay. So this is what we have. So only one, so if we, so if we postulate five models, if one of them is correctly specified, then we are, we are fine. And then we, what we can do is combine both of them. Uh, we can combine the propensity score idea and the mass input idea so, and, and, and um, obtain a so-called augmented estimator. So what is the augmented estimator? This is um, what we have. So we are going, so the idea is to solve the, this estimating equation. So it's a, it's a bit more complicated, but we are just augmenting. And what is the idea here? The idea is suppose that um, we, the, one of the, okay, so, so we have two choices. Either one of the propensity score adjusted uh, Sorry, either one of the participation model is correctly specified. What happens then? This is consistent for my parameter because this is, this is the IPW, right? 
And the difference between the, these two here is asymptotically equal to zero. So it vanishes. Or the other thing is that at least one of the participate the outcome regression model is correctly specified. In this case, this is my imputed estimator. This is a consistent estimator of my parameter. And we can show that this difference goes to zero. So at the end of the day, this estimator is consistent if one of the J plus K model is correctly specified. In other words, if we specify five participation models and five outcome regression models, so we have 10 models at the end, one of the 10 models needs to be correctly specified and this estimator will remain consistent. So this is the multiply robust. So we, 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 we uh, did a simulation to test um, this um, proposed uh, procedure. So what we did, we generated a thousand finite population, each of size 20,000. And in each population, we had two auxiliary variables, two predictors, X1 and X2. And this is our true outcome regression model. So this is the, the true relation, relationship between Y and X is just a simply a simple linear regression model uh, that depends on X1 and X2. Now, from each population, so we have 1,000 populations, and for each, from each population, we uh, selected the sample, probability sample, SA of size NA, using SRS without replacement. And we use two sizes, 500 and 1,000. So for n. Now we need also a non-probability sample. We have SA, we need SB. So how did we select SB? This was generated using a Poisson sampling design using this uh, probability of participation. So here the probability of participation is a logistic function that also depends on X1, X2. And so the values of uh, here in this model were chosen so that the size of the non-probability sample was also equal to 500 and, or, and 1,000. So this is how we, we, we did it. So we have SA and SB. Um, and now to, to assess the, the performance of the proposed method, so we, we need models that are correctly specified and we need models that are incorrectly specified. So in order to... Um, have models that are incorrectly specified, we defined new predictors, Z1 and Z2. So Z1 and Z2 are just a, a transformation of the X1 and X2. Remember that X1 and X2 are the, 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 the predictors that are related to the Y. So when I'm going, in what follows, when I say uh, the model is correctly specified, so the correct outcome regression and participation models Correct, were fitted using a linear regression and a logistic regression model respectively based on X1, X2. Sure, because the true model is a linear, for Y is a linear model based on X1, X2, and the true model for the, the part, probability of participation is a logistic uh, model based on X1, X2. And when we talk about the incorrect model, regression and participation, they, are, <clears throat> they correspond to a linear model and a logistic model, but based on Z1 and Z2. So we put the wrong predictors, and those will be uh, our wrong models, right? So our goal was to estimate the population mean of Y, but also the, the, the first quartile of, of Y. And so we computed several estimators. Uh, the first one is the unfeasible design weighted estimator. So what is this estimator? This will be just the Horvitz Thompson type in other words, if I had Y for the probability sample, I don't collect Y for the probability sample, but suppose I, I collect Y for the probability sample, we know this will be asymptotically design unbiased, right? So this, my, this is my benchmark. This is my infeasible, uh, infeasible estimator. Then we have the naive estimator. So the naive estimator is the estimator that where we take the non-probability sample and we estimate only based on the non-probability sample. Now remember that the non-probability sample is not a good miniature of the population. So this estimator is expected to be biased. Okay. And then we have adjusted estimators. So one, um, and, and you can see now we have four digits for each of the estimators. So why do we have four digits? Because we have, in, in this particular example, we have two possible outcome regression model, correct and incorrect. And we have two possible participation model, correct and incorrect. So at the end we have four possible models. So 
uh, when we have one zero, so the first two digits correspond to outcome regression model. So the first one is the correct model. The second one is the incorrect model. So if I have a one, it means that I use the correct model. If I have a zero, I haven't used. So it's like the use status. Did I use or did not use? So for example, in this one zero zero zero, I use the correct model. I didn't use the, uh, the uh, I use the correct out, outcome regression model. I did not use the incorrect, and I did not use any participation model. The last two digits are the for the participation model. Okay, so we use the parametric mass imputed estimator considered in and Kim and Al using the correct regression model. So there is only one outcome regression. So this is based on one model. On Y, and the incorrect. So incorrect means zero one. Then there is the family of doubly robust. So this was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, considered in Chen, uh, um, uh, Wu, and, uh, Chen Li and Wu in 2020, the paper I mentioned before. So they considered doubly robust. So in doubly robust, uh, we have uh, we specify one uh, um, outcome regression model and one uh, participation model. This is why we have two ones in every uh, uh, estimator. So what is one zero one zero? It means that I have the correct outcome regression model and I have the correct participation model. Zero one zero one means my estimator is based on the incorrect outcome regression model and the incorrect participation model. And then we have what we propose: the the multiply robust. So multi so we we have, so the multiply robust inverse probability weighting. Here I'm just using IPW, so I have no outcome regression model, zero, zero, and I'm using both of them, one, one, okay? And the MR, fractionally massive to the estimator, means here I'm using model, I'm using outcome regression model, I'm not using participation uh, uh, model. So I have one, one, zero, zero, I'm not using any participation model. And then we have the augmented multiply robust estimator, where we have, for example, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, and so on, and one, one, one means we used all models, the two good and the two bad, in the procedure. So this is it. So I'm going to present the result for the mean, and then the result for the 25th percentile. Now, in the 25th percentile, the table is not as large as for the mean, because for the mean, we consider the doubly robust uh, estimator considered in uh, Chen and Al. But they did, uh, in their paper, they did not consider the case of quantiles. So for quantiles, we, we don't have these estimators. And so let's look at what we have. Uh, so we, we can just focus on NA equal 500 and NB is equal 500. So the size of the probability sample and the size of the non-probability sample is 500. The benchmark, so the Invisible estimator, of course, is unbiased, so asymptotically unbiased. And we see that in terms of RMSC, relative root mean squared error, 1.59. Now, the naive, not surprisingly, is, which is based on the non probability sample only, is heavily biased, and of course, with a large RMSC. Now, the, uh, the parametric fractional imputation um, by Kim et al. Uh, does, of course, well when the, the model is correctly specified, so same efficiency as the, uh, the complete data estimator, if you want, and does bad when uh, the model is incorrectly specified. If we look at the doubly robust uh, family of Chen et al., not surprisingly, if at least, doubly robust means if at least one of the model is correctly specified, then the estimator is consistent, and we see this very clearly. In the first three cases, 1010, 1001, zero, 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 and 010, at least one of the models is correctly specified. And we see essentially no bias and pretty good efficiency. But when both models are misspecified, then of course, the, both models are misspecified, then we have a bias and we lose in inefficiency. In the, now, in the multiply robust family, uh, we have uh, essentially no, no bias here, less than 0.5%, and pretty good efficiency for 110, a bit less for 0011. So this is, uh, um, this estimator is when both uh, not the participation model are used, 1011, uh, one, and here this is the model where both outcome regression models are used. And then we have the, the rest of the family, which is the augmented, where they used 
more than two uh, models. And what's in, in, interesting, if we use one, 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 when we use the four models in the procedure, it actually, we don't lose in efficiency. So it's 1.59, which is the same as based on one parametric model, which is the same as the benchmark. So we're not losing uh, anything. So there is no loss of vision. Of course, I have two models. If I had 50 models, that could be another another story, right? Um, so, so we'll cover it. Now for the 25th percentile, same thing. The benchmark is pretty good, uh, as expected, with an RMSC of 2.85. The naive is bad, not surprisingly, with 12.87 uh, uh, and a large bias, so very large bias. Parametric family, uh, when the model is correctly specified, one single model, pretty good, so fairly small bias, uh, 3.45 for the efficiency, uh, but very bad in terms of bias when the model is incorrectly specified. Now, if we look at the multiply robust, all the multiply robust family, uh, they do pretty well. And surprisingly, some of them do even better than one based on one single model for the, so for example, here we in 1111, we have a 0.7 bias and 3.08 in terms of efficiency. And same thing here, uh, for this one is even 2.91. So for quantiles, the multiply robots seem to uh, work very well. Now, another, uh, which I, I don't show here, but uh, the multiply robust, and this has been shown um, uh, many times empirically. In fact, multiply robust can be viewed as an ensemble method, right? When you're in the case of non-ignorable non-response, then of course all the models will be misspecified because you cannot specify any model correctly. And what people have noticed in, in, in many, many papers is that when you combine uh, uh, several bad models, often what you get is better than one bad model. And uh, so it, uh, combining bad models leads to an inconsistent estimator. The estimator is still inconsistent, but it has better uh, 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 numerical properties than an estimator in general, than an estimator based on one bad model. So this is the advantage of an ensemble method that we have. And in, 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 the, in the NMAR, we've seen a, a, a pretty good result, even when all the models are misspecified. So I don't have time to present the, the but we, we have also bootstrap, uh, to, so uh, variance estimation, to estimate the variance of our estimators. And uh, I just want to show that uh, the, the result of a simulation study, uh, the, 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 the procedure is described, the bootstrap procedure is described in the, in the, in the paper, but we can see that we, we took all this uh, multiply robust family and we applied the bootstrap for both the mean and the 25th percentile. And essentially the, the biases are fairly small, less than 10%. And if we look at the coverage rate, we can see that we are not very far in every case, uh, uh, not very far from uh, 95%. So, the, which is, so the, the, the bootstrap procedure seems to work well in uh, fairly well in all the scenarios with coverage rate close to the nominal, nominal rate. Um, so again, the procedure is described in the, in the paper. So some final remarks. Um, here we considered the case of parametric, semi-parametric models. So if we want to do mass imputation, so if our goal is to say, okay, I, I, I want to assume J uh, outcome regression model, then we can easily replace this parametric model by machine learning models. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to fit, let's say, uh, random forest, regression trees, gradient boosting. For each of the method, I'm going to get the prediction, and I'm going to compress all these scores into one single score. And this is now establishing the theoretical properties of, of these uh, uh, could be more difficult because now we are dealing with machine learning. But from an implementation point of view, this is not different from doing parametric estimation. For propensity score weighting, so we always have this issue that you know we have the, 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 the this Chen Wu and Li method, right? Now people. So people have used, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Li and Wu with another student, they, 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 they use the same idea in the, in the, in the, that they use in the JESA paper, but with, for, with kernel regression. Because at the end, when you have kernel regression, 
the probability of response has, a, you know, it can be uh, expressed as a ratio. And the denominator, you use the non-probability sample, and the numerator, you use the probability sample. So you use the same trick over and over again. So they did kernel regression. We know kernel regression is uh, uh, vulnerable to the curse of dimensionality. So we can easily uh, uh, envision uh, the extension to generalized additive model, uh, and it will work because this is exactly the same idea. Now, uh, uh, in, in uh, Beaumont, uh, Jean-François Beaumont, Boza, and, and other people at, at StatCan, they, they used the, the idea of uh, uh, Chen, Li, and Wu, but for regression trees. And again, you have a ratio and you use the denominator, you use the, the, the non probability sample, the denominator, you use the, the probability sample, and, and, and you're done. So they use also regression trees. And the nice feature is here, you, you, you can, um, then, then we can imagine that we can do that for random forest and, and, and other methods. Um, and then we could combine uh, uh, these methods. So we, we could have, let's say, one logistic model, one uh, for, for, the, for the participation model, one uh, generalized additive model, one regression trees, one random forest, and fit them, and then combine this into a single score. So we could do that. And finally, um, I'll finish with this. So Chen Li and Wu proposed this nice uh, trick uh, uh, to, to be able to combine both the, uh, to, to combine the probability sample and the non-probability sample. Now, there is a recent paper by Wang, Valent, and Lin, Statistics in Medicine, that, who proposed an alternative method uh, to the method of Chen Li and Wu. It's, to be honest, the, their method is a, is a bit of a mystery. <laughs> I have traveled to understand the method, but it works. And I don't know why it works, but what they showed in their simulation, in the simulation is that in many scenarios, their method is more efficient than the method of Chen Li and Wu. And so they, have, they, they came up with the, uh, an estimating equation, which is different from the one that Chen Li and Wu. This estimating equation is unbiased, so they, we have no issue. So it's, it's a kind of a, a different model. Like, so they, they seem to assume a different uh, uh, parametric model. And why it, it, it works in their setup, simulation setup, I don't, I don't understand. So it's, it's a bit strange, and I, I, I need to understand uh, this method a, a bit more. But if it is more efficient, then w instead of using Chen Lian Wu as, we, as I did in my, then we could maybe use the method of Wang, Valiant, and Li. Uh, and maybe we'll gain even more inefficiency because if really their method is, is more efficient than Chen Li and Wu, then maybe we should we should look at, at, at incorporating this method in the multiply robust uh, uh, framework. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, and. Uh, uh, I think that all the audience appreciated the fact that you uh, remain strictly in the <laughs> time interval that was uh, forecasted for these uh, sessions. I should like to ask whether, uh, if there are questions from the audience. Yes, uh, I get the idea is nice, robustness is nice. Now I got a question with respect to the applicability of this thing. Like uh, uh, Romina this morning, she uh, told us, you see, they were trying to fit a model and they worked hard to try to fit the, the model. And you see, even for finding one model was tough. Now you're talking about fitting several models there. So uh, I know that you, you, you said a sentence very fast at some point. Oh, you just do this, for example, with, with machine learning or whatever. Now I would like to know a bit more about this uh, in the sense that, you see, how to find these models or how to, you see, because at some point, you see, it might be quite heavy stuff to do, like uh, several models and so on, just, just to have some insights. Uh, yeah, uh, so it, it, it's, it's a bit more work, uh, but at, at the same time, um, you know, uh, so I mean, the case of uh, Romina is a bit more complicated because it's, uh, uh, I think we, we you know, in the, the, in the setup I'm facing here, 
it's a it's a classical one file and she i think you had more than one file and so it's a more complicated here i have one property sample and one non-property sample so you have a vector of x variables uh, when you so for example using a random forest boosting uh, typically they can handle many variables so you can put the variables into the, so we've tried and uh, um, using this method, uh, and you put the variables and you don't have to do variable selection before. This is this is different from the, the, the framework because this is much more complicated, uh, but you would put, you, you would use your gradient boosting, your random forest and uh, other cubists, for example, the, and, and these methods, they tend to be very, very uh, stable, even if you throw in predictors and you would have different, and what we've seen, is that you you can have a machine learning that works well in one scenario, and in another scenario it doesn't work well, and so another method works well. So by having several uh, uh, method, if you're lucky, one of them will work well, and you'll do you'll do you'll do you'll do well. Um, and we don't know in advance because you can say why don't we use gradient boosting, for example, right? You don't know in advance boosting, boosting. So you may say why don't we use just gradient boosting, right? Because you don't know in advance if for your scenario, boosting will be good. Maybe something, Cubist, there is another one called Cubist. Maybe Cubist would be better for this scenario. Because you don't know, you say, I'm going to uh, fit these this three, four, five models. And hopefully, the ensemble, combining them, will be, will be pretty good. And this is what we've seen. Dr. Falosi? Uh, in the effort to find the um, correct model, I could uh, uh, I could uh, this is contrary to uh, I could uh, consider uh, many uh, uh, regression mass imputation models and uh, uh, and uh, participation models. And I would say if the, this generates a, a penalty in terms of capital, the increase in capital J and increase in capital K uh, in the procedure, this generates increasing uh, of uh, variability of the estimates or not, because I could uh, extend uh, a lot uh, the search of the good model in order to obtain uh, bias. Okay. I don't know if you have investigated. This. Okay, so your question is what happens when, when J increases and K increases? Yeah. yeah. So the way we combine the scores, I think we, we have some flexibility and we can, uh, is we, we do this uh, compressing, right? We do linear regression. And essentially at this step, what what is being done is like a, is like a variable selection. Because this, this way, the way we compress here will put more weight on the true model, right? And less weight on the wrong model. So, um, so even if you have a lot, I don't know, even if you have 10 or 20 models, then uh, you're doing a kind of variable selection. So it's not that affected. Now, there is another way to compress information is through calibration. Now, if you, which is not here, are, now, if you compress through calibration, then you have 20 calibration constraints, and then you may have very dispersed weight, and this will give, you know, uh, uh, unstable estimates. Now, we haven't tried 20, 30, so I, I don't know how it, it will behave, but I'm pretty sure that we could go to five and 10, we've, we've done five and 10, and it's, it's not affected by, so you could use five, six methods of machine learning, for example, and we haven't seen any, you know, uh, you know, loss of efficiency or something strange. If we use 50 of them, maybe something will, you know, will happen. I don't know. Thank you. Um, there is a doctor. Thank you. Ladies first. Uh, since your next slide, I think, yeah, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, here. So tau two hat. Maybe um, the second part is the sum over S B. If you just do the sum over S A and then you weight it, maybe you get some of the usual gain of like the ratio estimator. Can you can you repeat the in the um, in the slide? Here. So, so you get the sum over S B there, 
Yes. If you get the sum over SA and you weight that just like the first bit, so it would be pi i minus one V2i, maybe you can get something, I mean, exploit the correlation between the numerator and then the denominator as you have in the ratio estimator, and maybe you get something that is more efficient, uh, but. But the, C, the thing here in SB here, it comes from the fact that you have delta i. Yeah, but you can. So here you, you, you have, you, right? So you have this uh, weight, this uh, least square, right? And ah, you see, you're not you see what I mean? Is the same. So naturally the SB will, will come out. And you have this ratio, and it's always the same. You have this ratio where you, you always have, have SB, SA, in the numerator and denominator. So this is why, and this is the idea that was used in kernel regression, you know, uh, regression trees. So every time you have a, this type of ratio, then you use one here, like a, the non-property sample here, and the property sample there. And the uh, the other um, curiosity was uh, what's the uh, which is the link between your fractional imputation, like a, and the projection estimation of Rao and Kim, the Kim and Rao. Once you have the model, you can just project that in your y, in your uh, probability sample. You can project your y using the axis and then just use uh, pr predicted y's. Yeah, you Here? learn the model uh, from SB, and then you just predict that there. Yeah. And then that's the basic projection estimator yeah. of Rao yeah. Kim. You just have a fractional. Yeah. So which is the link between the two? The link between the, the Kim and Rao? Because I have trouble to, to, to. Ah, I, to be honest, I don't remember exactly what Kim and Rao did, so. Uh, but this is two-phase sampling. This is the paper. The... Ah, I see. We do fractional. They don't do fractional, right? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, very quickly, so um, um, what what do you think would be as a naive benchmark um, from the set of ensemble methods? So, for instance, uh, as a competitor to your method, if you just take the K models and assuming all K models are all mismatched, as happened in practice, you just take you know apply a norm normal estimator and then take take some you reduce at the end you make a a reduction at the end, at the very end, you probably have, uh, so you take the ensemble of the final estimate at the end. So that would be a very naive way of taking strengths from an ensemble of models. But the question is, how does it perform uh, compared to, to your estimator where you do the compression um, as an intermediate step uh, within the model? Okay, and the second is whether you expect that uh, your, the robustness that you are achieving by applying ensemble methods also gives you some, some robustness in the case that the SAR as a sample as, as A has some bias. So do you think that you are also gaining robustness in that direction or not? Okay, so I'll start with the first question. So the question is, the, in your first question, um, uh, your suggestion is, okay, I have uh, k-methods, I get an estimate from each of the k-methods, and then I combine these estimates. Sure, uh, we, can, we, can, we can do that. Uh, now, how to, to, to do that? Uh, so we have to take, uh, yeah, we, I guess we could do that. Uh, have you seen something like, like this? Yeah. This will be a natural reference benchmark to justify your method because, because your method is they clearly getting strengths from the ensemble of K methods. But under us, and it's a very powerful property that if just one of them is correct, it's yeah. consistent. But in practice, none of them will be, consist, will be, will be correct. Sure. And then I'm very curious, you know, what would you say to, to somebody to say, okay, but well, let's just apply a naive ensemble method, which is apply the K models to existing estimators and do the reduction at the very end. 
but but when you say combine them, just take the average of these. Yeah, the, average or whatever. Yeah, but this whatever. is where I, I don't know if they would. Then I don't think you get the consistency. Then I don't think you can show that they, they are consistent. The, the, then the result is same. So you would have to take a particular way of you know you have to combine them in a particular way. I'm sure it, they will not yeah. be consistent. I'm sure it will ah, not I be totally. consistent. Yeah. I'm not asymptotic, but also yeah. yours is consistent only asymptotically. Yeah. Right. So in the finite size regime. So we're not in asymptotic, we are in finite size regime, given a certain n a and b, given a certain k and j, whatever. I would be interested in uh, numerically assessing the performance uh, uh, of this of naive, naive uh, ensemble ex post yeah, yeah. versus your you know, na uh, na nice, sure, nice method. Sure, that's a good point. Yeah. This would be a, a natural uh, reference benchmark. Yeah, be, be, because uh, I mean, your idea is a bit what I mean. Essentially, what we do in random forests, right? Uh, this is you know you have trees, you, you, and then uh, many of these estimates will be wrong. It will be based on right because depending on the and you you take an average, right? So uh, yeah, we we could uh, try that, sure. Thank you, David, for the talk. Very interesting. Um, I'm not an expert, but you know, on the face of it, you have a, a random sample, and then you have these non-probability samples. As a statistician, I'm always nervous if the non-probability sample size overwhelms the random sample size, because you know the quality in the non-probability sample could be uh, compromised by you know, um, let's say you have a very low effective sample size or things like that. Can you comment on the error that you see in your models that comes from the non-probability part of your sample? How is that affecting the quality, the final quality of your estimators? So the size of the non-probability sample. Yeah, or, or properties of it. I mean, somehow I expect it to depend on the quality of the non-probability sample in the sense of... Um, That's a good question. I. So you think that the quality of the estimator will be depend on the size of the non-probability sample? Because at yeah. the end, remember, we have this more assumption. Yes, and you rely heavily. So with heavy, the more yeah. assumption, we solve, uh, right? Because the relationship is, is, is correct, right? So then uh, I don't think that the size will affect, right? Should, shouldn't be a problem, I think, because if you imagine you let the n b goes to cap n, then the selection problem goes. So it's, it's, it, I don't I don't think it should be. A problem. But I'm I'm curious because in a way I feel like this setup maybe I don't know if it is true, but is actually in some sense obscuring the the reach of this message because I think. Now, if you think about a situation, right, standard situation, suppose I have x for everyone in the population, and I have observed y in addition in a non-probability subset, right? So in that case, the first sample A is gone. There's no more extra information. So you're just concentrating on the second table where you have x filled up. You see me? And that brings the core of the problem. Because everything else is just to say, if I want to do something with X, but I don't have all the X, then a, a sample A can help me to do something in addition. Yeah. But that's actually a side story, I think. I think that is actually a side story. The real story is say, I have all the X, I have observed some Y, I just have, don't know what is the selection mechanism. So I now have two problems. A, I don't know how to learn the sort of, my, my learning of the model Y, so the outcome model may be wrong, that's the usual problem. If I have only sort of simple or sort of, sort of uh, ID, then I have only this problem. But if in addition I don't have ID, I do suffer from selection problem, so I'm going to deal with this problem. And I think that will give the message stronger to the machine learning mainstream people. Because here, this is like, a, you're, you're obscuring it because the people may not get what is the, what is the benefit of this kind of thinking. Because here we're thinking, for machine learning people, you see, you have a, you have a sample, convenience sample. 
right? You can learn any algorithm, fancy algorithm you want. How do you know you, your, your model can generalize to the out of sample? If you don't deal with the selection problem, there's no way you can deal with this problem. You have to deal with selection problem. That's the message to the mm. mainstream machine learning people. And that message will be clearer if you take away this setup of so SASB, just can't go to, I have the population X, I have a subsample, which I don't know how it is selected. So now I would do, consider both things, right? So the, the, the multiple outcome model, that's ensemble learning. That's you said, okay, they, they've done this too, but now I'm going to give you the ensemble learning approach, how do you can sort of deal with the selection problem in addition, and therefore somehow you're coming better out of it than just ignoring it. Right? But isn't it your setup just a, like a classical missing data setup? Yeah, it's, it's a no, it's no, it's setup a, where the set of respondent is the non is a non probability setup. Don't even think about respondent. <laughs> don't machine learning. Don't, you don't yeah, even but say, I mean that's you, that's the you question. have a data you set. You have a data set yeah. where you have x and y, and then you have the people you really out of the data set really want to apply the learning yeah. to. Because so otherwise, what's the point of that. learning, right? Sure, sure. So now you assume for all the ones you want to apply the learning sure, to, you have x. That's it. Sure, that's as sure. simple as that, right? Now, but the problem, because I don't, normally people say, I assume ID, so I only have outcome learning problem. But now you say, no, you don't have ID. You have selection problems. You need to deal with yeah, both yeah, problems. Sure, sure, and sure. then you say that actually, in order to deal with the selection problem, you can also, you also use ensemble learning. Yeah. Techniques, right? No, right. And then, then you can do better. better. Yeah, and I think that message will reach out to a broader audience. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lavalet, do you want to add something? So you can answer. I'm not totally sure that I picked up everything you were speaking pretty fast. And then, uh, like, uh, uh, just, uh, I think that, you see, the more general setup of this is to have a cap NA and a cap NB. In the sense that they, uh, often you see what you have in reality is that you, you, the, the populations are where the probability sample have been selected from might be, yes, the same type of population where the non-probability have been sampled, but not necessarily of the same size. Let me explain. Uh, probably the the, prob the population where the probability sample have been selected is often a subset of the population where the non-probability sample have been say taken. You see, for example, you have you have the population uh, for your probability samples. So you have a clear cut, say, for example, Canadian population or Italian population at some point in time, and so on. Okay, great. That's it. Now, what is the non-probability sample? Often, you see this data coming from a super large data set that is probably containing the Italian population, or maybe even partially containing the Italian population, but something sure. much bigger, which might be some countries of Europe or whatever. And then you have, so, but the, the, so, so the setup is a more, I would say, more general in some sense. And my, so this is why you see, for example, what, what Legion was saying, you see what about the, the X's available for the old population and the no, non-probability sample, it's not available. You see, you have this data set that is there, super large, super large population, you have fraction of it, a non-probability sample, and you say, okay, can I use this non-probability sample for my population, say, uh, omega A that we call, it. Like you see this, one that the, the, the where you probably sample have been taken. So this, I think, this is the more general setup that should be looked at or considered, and because this is the thing that we found in real life most of the time. And yeah, um, and uh, and I'm wondering. So you have two is, different is populations. That, hmm? So you, you're saying you have two different populations. Yes, UA and, and UB. The second one is probably uh, the. Bigger than the first one, containing the first one, I would say. Which one contains the first one? Uh, the 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 one where the non-probability sample have been is there. The, okay, say population P A and P B. Okay, population P A is probably contained in population P B. So why is this? 
I don't because I, in give real you life, an example this, where 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 PA is contained in PB. All right, like you see, you have the first one is a clean cut population where you sample from it. You have a register or you have some kind of a file and a list frame sure. you select. The other one, big data. Big data coming from a source that is undefined or probably containing the first population, but much bigger. And yeah, the assumption here is no, you have a big data that you know comes from this target, the same target population. Now, if you say I have the Italian population, but uh, uh, this is my target population, but my non property source can contain everybody in Europe, then that's another problem. Because now we have a, it's a, it's a and, this is a different and, problem. Yes, but the thing is that most of the time you cannot even identify where this non probability sample is coming from. You see, like a, it's very large. Sure. Sure, sure. And the assumption is that the model that you will fit for the non probability sample will fit the probability one. Not to, the the model sure. that you will fit from the non probability sample yeah. will will be valid for using it for the population where the probability sample have been taken. Sure, this is what we, this is what we do. This what we do is exactly this. We estimate the the, the relationship with S B and we applying to S A. Exactly. So we, we have this I assumption mean. where where you can uh, exactly. This is what I say, but using this super large other population which for which population pp super large one big data something that is very large that is available yeah i'm not uh, i'm not uh, well, we have oh, to we discuss can discuss after. this <laughs> i'm not uh, in front of i don't see why we have one super large and one not super large right? for me this is the same population uh, so maybe i'm missing something. So you say, suppose actually people just empirically and doing experiment and things like that. They say, they say, actually, if if none of these models are correct, because it's actually hard to imagine one of them exactly be correct. But still, because I'm doing ensemble learning, because I'm combining a set of misspecified model, I'm still doing better than relying any of those misspecified models, right? But even that statement. Uh, needs needs maybe some qualification of the misspecification. Can it be any misspecified model? That, that's a, actually that's a good right. question. So actually, your misspecified model is still the best things you've done. You've spent some effort putting on. You're, you're not going to throwing any models that's obviously completely off the mark, yeah, right? So, so, that, that's yeah. the idea. So, so your, your exactly. question here is: if you if you if you have different models, how do you want the, these models to lead to similar predictions? Or to different predictions, right? It's a, I w I, intuitively, I, I would like this model to have different predictions because you don't know where the true is. But if you're lucky, the true is in the middle, and you know by combining you sh you shrink towards the the, the true, right? They, they, you average in some sense, right? Whereas if they are all here, and and your true value is here, you're not doing much, right? So now the question is, can we? How can we define the distance between models, right? So to to that's that's a that's a yeah that's something we, yeah we we we, talk, we talked about this a bit but uh, not uh, uh, yeah 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 uh, yeah exactly so there is something to be done maybe there to to how to postulate these wrong models or to do uh, yeah uh, there should be a question uh, on the chat uh, by Paolo Righi, but is still typing. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Not yet. Well, um, maybe uh, Paolo can pose the question out of yeah. the session, yeah, of okay? Oh. Because indeed, uh, I think that I, we thank the 
speaker and the kind audience for uh, this uh, passionate discussion uh, on the topic of the masterclass. We thank really everybody for coming here, for being and resisting here until now. And I invite uh, all of you to come tomorrow at nine o'clock in the morning. Thank you very much.